Legends. Hey everybody, this is the Zot Man coming to you with an audio commentary for RWBY Volume 1 Episode 1. This episode is simply called Ruby Rose. Now, for any of you who have not watched this show, which honestly, if you haven't yet, I highly recommend you do before you watch this commentary, uh, RWBY is an anime-style series made by Rooster Teeth, uh, the same creators of the Machinima series Red vs. Blue, which is on its 13th season now. And uh, Ruby is Ruby here is on its, um, it has had two volumes now, with the third volume coming out in late fall. Now this show was created by a man, a guy named Monty Ohm. He did some of the fight sequence animation for... Um, for Red vs. Blue seasons nine, uh, 8, 9, and 10. Uh, he did a phenomenal job with that, and then he decided he wanted to, to direct his own show. He felt inspired to uh, create uh, his own world and kind of start this whole grand story, so this was the result of it. Uh, unfortunately, you know, sadly, he passed away in February this year. Uh, he was, um, he ended up in a coma, uh, from some kind of allergic thing uh, that he was exposed to during a hospital procedure and he uh, died while he was in that coma. So very unfortunate, you know, very sad. He was a really inspirational guy, but uh, the other creators such as uh, Miles Luna and Carrie Shawcross who were writers and producers for this show that they are still going to continue making this show, so I'm really happy about that, but I think it's going to definitely feel different with the fact that Monty is gone. So, we're on the first scene here where we have uh, basically one of the villains of the series, Roman Torchwick, coming into uh, a dust shop. Now, one of the things that uh, Monty Ohm and the crew emphasized in this show is that, you know, dust is a very, very powerful and special uh, thing in the world of Remnant. Uh, Remnant is the name of the world that Ruby takes place on. And this is, um, and I just, I think it is a little odd that you can just commonly, you can simply find this dust in, you know, in a store. Like, you can walk into a gas station, and, you know, and find coke there simply, you know, it's just, it's really, I think it's a little bit odd that, that they have dust shops like these with basically like these machines, almost like pop machines, just like, hey, you can, you know, you can fill up a container full of dust, pay for it, and, I mean, you can basically take it and do almost whatever you want with it. Um, so there we have Ruby uh, listening to her music. She's got uh, her rose emblem on her headphones, and she's listening to uh, basically the first volume's theme song, This Will Be The Day, which in later episodes, characters are actually listening to songs that you'll find on the RWBY soundtrack, so that basically gives me the impression that that music, the music we hear on the soundtrack, those songs actually do exist in the world of Remnant. I don't exactly understand how that can be um, possible, considering that some of those songs are centered around some of the characters, like Red Like Roses is for Ruby, and From Shadows is for Blake, um, Mirror Mirrors for Weiss, and, you know, etc. Uh, so here we get, like, one of those first fight sequences, and this was actually the moment when I started watching the show. This was the moment where I was, I realized I was sold on this, because I was already a huge fan of Montium's fight sequences, um, in RVB's 9 and 10, and so when I got to see a scene with the fighting style being very similar to that, having that same, you know, crazy adrenaline rush to it, uh, it got me really excited, uh, and I was basically hooked on this show at the first minute. I wasn't even entirely sure what it was going into it. I actually got into it a little late, because I hadn't been wa really watching any Rooster Teeth for a while, and um, uh, all I really knew it for was Red vs. Blue, and so when I heard about this show, RWBY, and I heard that it was being directed by the same dude who um, made those fight sequences in RVB, I was really excited. I didn't know what that could possibly mean. And I was also really intrigued by how different this show feels compared to a show like Red vs. Blue. Just everything, you know, from the animation and um, at the voice acting and the storytelling, and the world that it takes place in, and just also, I'd like to add that this show is much, much tamer than Red vs. Blue. Um, the jokes are 
you know, quite innocent compared to compared to those of RVB. Uh, there's no language, like, to be found in this show uh, whatsoever. And the worst violence that you're really going to find in this show uh, is basically... Um, the worst the worst violence you're going to find in this show is basically uh, Creatures of Grimm, you know, which is, like, the monsters that lurk on the planet, uh, you know, getting beheaded or, you know, limbs hacked off and stuff like that. But it's, but it's really of not... Not really much to be concerned about, considering they are monsters in the first place. You can, you know, you can tear monsters up all day and still get like a PG rating. So uh, this is a this is an this is an intense fight sequence between Glinda Goodwitch and who we will eventually get to know as Cinder Fall, uh, who also turns out to be basically the main antagonist of the series. Obviously, you got to have some kind of twist that the villain you thought was the main antagonist is actually working for someone else. And this, um, and not even five minutes into the episode, and we already get to see how characters like Glinda and Cinder, how really just truly powerful they are. Cinder is just taking out everything in her power, or at least as much as we know that she can use for now. And we get to see Glinda use a, a tremendous amount of power, so uh, that was really cool. So here we get a really geek out moment from Ruby and like, can I have your autograph? And, uh, well, here she is getting interrogated. So I actually, I know Glinda, um, is played by, uh, Kathleen Zelch, who was Agent Texas in Red vs. Blue, and I thought that was really cool when I first found out that was her. Uh, also ironic that she has, um, green eyes, which, yeah, I, I know that is to be, like, Carolina's eyes in Red vs. Blue, um, and I don't really want to get into too much of, like, spoiler territory there, but that was, um, that was something that, uh, I know there's, like, a connection, a uh, big twist in Red vs. Blue having to do with, um, Texas family. So, anyway, here we see Professor Ozpin, um, kind of having this moment where you're kind of like, okay, what was that all about? You know, you have silver eyes. Uh, I know Professor Osmond to be the guy who voiced, uh, um, Agent Washington in Red vs. Blue, and gosh, I just, I really, really like him here. He's extremely charismatic. You know, Shannon McCormick can just do a really wide range of voices, and he's really good here, and in fact, I, I actually like to practice Osmond's voice once in a while. Um, my throat's really dry right now, so I don't know how effective it would be. But, you know, I, sometimes I'll, sometimes I'll go for, like, uh, different, different voice shots. I'll just go, you have silver eyes. So, I, I don't know how good <laughs> that was at the moment, to be honest. Uh, maybe the, maybe the fact that my throat is really dry right now actually, um, you know, actually gives me an advantage. So this is Ruby kind of just going all, like, passionate and geeky. And this is actually a moment for me where... I started getting sold on um, Ruby's character. I know that uh, she's voiced by uh, Lindsay Jones, and uh, she's also Kimball in Red vs. Blue, which actually I did not, I did not like. Um, I did not like the way she did Kimball. I think it, I thought it was very dry and very tedious, very monotone, always kind of seeming to have the same emotion um, through the whole thing. So here I, I love the fact that Ozpin is being like. He's basically, technically, like, studying Ruby here. And I also love that look he gives Glinda. You know, it's kind of a moment of chemistry between the two of them, which is something I kind of hope to see more later on in the series. I really want to see more, I guess, you know, more time between Ozpin and Glinda. I'll confess I am a shipper of the two. Uh, and I actually am actually writing a fanfic series currently called Team Ozpin, which is basically a prequel series uh, focusing on Ozpin and Glinda. And... Uh, two other professors that we've seen in this series so far, uh, Professor Ublick and uh, Professor Port. And basically, it's, you know, we get to see their time before they became professors, before Beacon Academy was established. Um, in the series, Ospin is responsible for the establishment of Beacon. Uh, so I hope you guys check that out. Uh, check that out. I can put the uh, fanfic in the... Um, a link to the fanfic in the description below. Elisa Lavender is a name that seems to be emphasizing more that when it comes to the characters' names, it's very significant. Um, 
it's it's actually a lot more significant than people might think. You know, it has something to do with like color or maybe a historical figure or something like that, um, or just like a fairy tale character. You know, kind of for instance, you know, Yang is Goldilocks and Ruby is you know Red Riding Hood. Glinda Goodwitch is actually a spin on um, you know uh, the Good Witch character from The Wizard of Oz. Um, I've also seen Oz the Grand and the Powerful, which which I actually, unlike a lot of other people, I actually really, really liked that movie. Me and my family had a really fun time watching that movie. Uh, I really liked it. I would totally see it again. So, I think this is one scene in particular where the whole thing with the silhouettes, all the background characters are silhouettes this time, is really, really kind of, you know, becomes much more noticeable. I'm really glad that that was actually something they fixed in Volume 2. They actually gave background characters character models. So basically, in this volume, whenever, like, for instance, Jean here, whenever we see a character that is not a silhouette, they really stand out, and we know that they're supposed to be important in some way. So, yeah, this is the big ship heading to Beacon. Um, a lot of the animation in this volume, you know, almost looks colored. It almost looks like a painting, which I think is really cool. So now we're on to the intro, Rooster Teeth Presents. And this is actually, I mean, I like the intro in the second volume, but I actually like the intro in the first volume way more. Um, I just, I think it just looks cooler. I like how they seem to kind of plant these seeds of story in the intro for volume one that we're not quite, we're not quite sure what they mean just yet. I just think that's really cool. I love how Jeff Williams is doing the music for this volume. I'm a huge fan of his music in Red vs. Blue. I think... He's just so good at doing adrenaline, you know, adrenaline rush type music. I also love Casey Lee Williams' um, singing. I think she's a very talented singer, especially for how young she is. That's it for my commentary for the first episode. Um, you know, subscribe so that you'll know uh, when I release my commentary for the second episode. See you guys later.